And once you become an attorney in France, you are allowed to wear the robe or toge with its rabat and epitoge. For everyone listening and watching out there, welcome to the Young Foreign Lawyers Profile Series. My name is Paris Malakuti. Of course, I am a California licensed immigration attorney, and I love interviewing other professionals and lawyers from other countries. Today, I'll be interviewing uh, Michel Nassar, who is a French born and educated lawyer. I'm going to ask him about how somebody becomes a lawyer in France. I'm going to ask him about the educational requirements, the licensing requirements. Um, for how a, a French citizen becomes a lawyer in France. And I'm also going to ask him how a foreigner becomes a lawyer in France. So first of all, welcome, Michel. How are you? Hey, Barbies. I'm fine and you. Doing very well. Very well. Very excited for this interview. So I guess now we can get right into um, some of the educational requirements to become a lawyer in France there, right? Um, as you know, in the United States, Michel, uh, most people, most lawyers, most people who go to law school don't end up having actually an undergraduate major that's related to law. We go to graduate school to get our JD, Juris Doctorate, but it's not the case there in France, is it? It isn't. We start right after high school. We start with a three-year licence in, Fran in French. It's a bachelor degree. From there, we continue with M1 and M2 stands for Master 1 and Master 2. Okay. So it's yeah. right. Okay, great. So in your case, you graduated from high school and you went directly to the University of Versailles Saint-Quentin, right? Exactly, exactly. I went to Versailles Saint-Quentin. It's the full name of the Versailles University. And I studied there three years with a um, licence en droit privé so it's a bachelor in private law. Uh, during the three years, I went as an exchange student for one semester in Lebanon to St. Joseph University. And I studied there compared law, French and Lebanese law. Okay, got it. And the University of Versailles St. Quentin is right next to the Versailles Palace, right? You can just throw a stone at it, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what everyone thinks. It's not true, it's false. Uh, the the law school is actually ten minutes from Versailles, so it's just uh, the Saint Quentin city. Okay, so so it's false advertising, huh? University of Versailles. Completely, completely. Don't go there only if you expect <laughs> to be studying right at the castle. <laughs> got you, got you. Okay, so you went to the University of Versailles Saint Quentin for your uh, the equivalent of bachelor's. You guys call it licence, right? Yes. And did you end up going, Michel, directly to your Master One, or did you take time off between the licence and Master One? No, I, I went directly. You went directly. Okay. Okay, got it. So uh, there's a Master One and a Master Two. Um, of course, I know from personal experience a little bit about the Master Two because that's how I met you, right? We were in the same Master Two at University of Versailles, Saint Quentin. Uh, before we get to that, though, I'd like to ask you. So. Uh, when you do the Master 1 and the Master 2 in France, does it have to be the same specialization or can you have different specializations between those two? Yeah, you ha it has to be related. So usually in the M1, you start to specialize. So let's say you will have uh, M1 in business law and during the M2, you will specialize even more. Within the business law, you specialize in finance law, in tax law, corporate law. So this is how it works. Uh, there is some differences between universities. Some of some of them will have a more strict specialization or pre uh, precise specialization during the M1. Uh, others will have only two specialization, private and public law. And from there, you will have to choose your courses. So you'll choose your courses according to what you want to continue with during for the m2 okay got it and the m1 and the m2 are both roughly a year correct exactly yeah so it's okay. two years five years from high school five years from high school okay so at university of versailles saint canton when you did your m1 uh did you have any professors in particular that stood out to you that made an impression on you um, actually you know you know the this particular professor sandrine clavel 
mm. because she she was also giving us the national law course during the M2. So yes, she she she. I think I like what I like the most uh, during her class is that she she used PowerPoints and she gave us in advance the topic of the class because I I think you know in France we we are used to have lectures and small classes after the, the lecture. Uh, we discover the topic, the subject during the, the lecture. So sometimes it looks like you're just listening and writing down. And sometimes you don't even have the time to understand what's happening during the class. So with something Clavel, it was different. We had the topics for all the semester beforehand. So we could prepare in advance for the class, and we we had more of a debate and conversation. Got it. In yeah, got it. Yeah, of course. I remember Professor Sandrine Colvel, and I remember she was always on point with her PowerPoint PowerPoint presentations. So shout out to Professor Sandrine Colvel from UVSQ. Um, okay, great. So you're in the Master One. Um, do you have to send an application to? schools for the M2 when you're in the M1, or can you just continue on to the M2 if you're in the same school? No, you have to send an application. You have to send an application. Okay. So in your M1 year, you applied for M2, of course. Okay. Yeah. Um, before we get to how you started the M2 at UVSQ, um, I know lawyers there don't have to do the M2. Is that correct? Correct. M1 is enough to take the bar exam. Uh, most of us have M2 as well. I would say maybe over 95%. Uh, it would depend on one, what the area you want to practice in. In some areas like criminal law, M1 can be enough. In other areas like in, let's say, finance law, international law, you have to be more specialized. So you, you have to go on with the M2. Okay, and Michelle, just to follow up, when you say uh, for some areas like international law or finance law, you need to be more specialized. Does that mean that it's a requirement to take the M2 or it's just highly recommended to get an M2? It isn't a requirement. It's highly recommended. Highly recommended. Okay, got it. Okay, so yeah. poor job, right, to make yourself more competitive, I imagine. Exactly. Okay, got it. Uh, for example, in criminal law, you have to practice more. You have, you have a lot to learn in the field. So okay, so you started the M2 in September of 2011, correct? Correct. Okay, so our class in the M2 was a relatively small class, about 30 students, super international. Of course, we had representation from Colombia, from Venezuela, Dominican Republic, Finland, um, you know, Morocco, Lebanon, of course. Um, in comparison, what was that, Michelle? Benin as well. Benin, of course, we can't forget about Benin. Um, in comparison, how big were the classes in the M1 and how were the, the classes structured there? In the M1, we were over 100, something like one, 120, 30. Okay, got it. So, you did the M1, you did the M2 at UVSQ. Uh, we were together in the fall semester of 2011. In December, I got on a plane. I went home to uh, my host school, which is the University of Miami. You guys all continued in the spring, and then you graduated from the M2 in the spring, correct? Um, technically, we graduated in the fall, in October. Okay. We had uh, we finished had the course work. in the spring, correct? Exactly, exactly. And right yeah. after we started exams and then internship period. And from there, after the three months obligatory uh, internship, we had uh, we graduated and most of us continued the internship. OK, got it. So let's get right now into some of the licensing requirements after you finished with your education. Right. So um, you finished the M2. OK. Now, Michel, I know in France, there's kind of two exams that are very important that are related to the, to the, to the bar. Uh, here in the United States, it's very yeah. simple. Graduate from law school, we take the one bar exam, and if you pass, you get sworn in and you're a lawyer, that's it. But over there, it's quite different actually, right? 
It is different, yes. We have the first exam, the entrance exam, and the second exam, the end exam. The first exam is called CRFPA in French, CRFPA. The second exam is called CAPA, C-A-P-A. -A. So right after the M1, you are eligible to take the CRFPA exam. You have to prepare for the exam within a university. There is a legal study center called IEJ. I -E -J. You have to attend the classes there. It's highly you don't have to attend, but it's highly recommended. You take the exam first, a written exam, then oral exam, and if you pass this exam, you are eligible to attend the bar school. The bar school consists of four periods. The first one is a six months of actual classes. There you have, from there you have first six months period of internship and another six months period of internship. And then again, approximately four months of exams, it's two weeks, then you have free summer, then again, two weeks of exam. And then you have to wait more than one month for uh, the result. Okay. Um, the so, first, sorry, yes. go ahead. No, I was saying the first, the first internship during the bar school must be in at any place but a French law firm. So it can be in a company in France, it can be in a law firm abroad, it can be in a company abroad, in an institution like in, the, like for example, let's say the Court of Appeal or NGO, but not a French law firm. The second internship must be in a French law firm. And, and right after it, you go on with the CAPA exam, First, in early July, then you have the summer uh, for, for, for yourself. Maybe you can go on vacation or some of us continue with an internship. And then back in September, you have another uh, period of exams. And then you wait, hopefully, for, uh, for the CAPA degree. Okay, great. You gave me a lot of information to unpack here. So let me just go back to the beginning of what you said. Um, the EIJ is the institute that you study in in order to take an exam to gain entrance to the bar school. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Correct. Well, first of all, what does EIJ stand for in French? Institut d'études judiciaires. Okay. Okay. Institut d'études judiciaires. And what does yeah. that mean in English? You have to tell me since you learned French. I Let's think... See. Let's see if you can the, remember some French. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's the Judicial Studies Institute. Exactly. Because okay. actually, actually, you can attend this institute not only to become a lawyer, but to become a judge or a public notary. So it's not only for attorneys. Got it, got it. And a little bit later, Michelle, I'm going to ask you about how much all of this process costs or how little it costs, I should say, especially in comparison to the United States. Um, but let me get back to this real quickly. So how long does a student typically study at the EIJ before taking the entrance exam to bar school, the CRFPA? Uh, somewhere from one year to six months before the, the exam. Okay, so from six months to a year. And then do most people study full time or do they have a job and then study on the weekends? H how does that work? Uh, well, it really depends. Some of us study full time, others will have a job or or maybe an internship so it really depends okay it really depends okay got it so you you study in the uh institute of judicial studies okay all right um you take the crfpa okay yes go through your first internship which is anything but a french uh, law firm okay well after the crfpa you have to enter the bar school yes. enter the bar school Okay, I'm sorry, excuse me. Six months of study first, you said, correct? Exactly. Okay, exactly. then six months of internship anywhere except for a French law firm. True. Okay, then six months internship at a French law firm. Okay, then at the end you take the CAPA, C-A-P-A exam. Yes. Okay. Now, I imagine, Michel, uh, that the final exam before you become a lawyer has got to be the hardest one. Is that right? It's not the case, actually. I don't know it because 
yeah, I don't know if it's because we get used to a certain level of exam or just because it's really not as difficult as the first one. But it, there has to be some selection at some point. So I assume they just want it to be as early as possible. So the hardest exam is the written exam. So the first part of the CRFPA exam. Okay, right. Yeah, and I was saying that a little bit tongue-in-cheek because I know that the reputation is that the CRFPA is significantly more difficult than the Kappa exam, right? It is, yes. And um, that, that's always been something that's been weird for me to wrap my head around because, uh, you know, I, I'm used to the American system where the final exam, the bar exam, is the most right. difficult exam. Yeah. Um, and the, this process is actually different for foreign lawyers, isn't it? It is. It is. For foreign lawyers, we have what we, a, a special exam we call article 100 exam because it, it comes from uh, a decree. It's an uh, executive order. Uh, so we, we call it, sh in short, um, article 100, article 100. Okay. Foreign lawyer, if you are um, attorney admitted to a foreign bar, so let's say you, Parvi, if you want to become attorney in France, since you are qualified in California, you will only have to take two written exams and two oral exams. It will be substantially the same. It, it will cover the same area as our exam, but in a much shorter format. So it, it's a matter of month, maybe three to four months between the first and the last exam. So uh, often foreign lawyers will travel, let's say, for the first written and then go back and then come again to France for the oral exam. Okay, got it. And um, actually, I have a friend right now who is an American lawyer, California licensed. His name is Mark Weitz. Shout out to Mark. He's studying right now for the uh, Article 100 exam. Um, he's going to be taking it in March, I believe. Um, so just in two months. So, um, Michelle, is the Article 100 exam considered easier or more difficult than the process for French people? Uh, it's easier. It's, it's easier. easier. Okay. And is that primarily because it's shorter? First, because it's shorter. And second, because they know when you are dealing with foreign attorneys that maybe sometimes they, will, they, will, they won't have the same French level as others. Or maybe their practice won't require the same, maybe let's say, uh, I won't say the same qualification, but they, it won't require the, the, the same standard. And plus, they have, um, there is a kind of trust in foreign legal systems. So if you are qualified in another country, why shouldn't you be qualified for ours? As long as you took the minimum requirement of French procedure and uh, French ethics for the bar. Got it. And um, for, the, for all the listeners, I'm going to actually post links in the description to the Article 100 text so you, so you guys can read it. Okay, Michelle, so uh, now I want to ask you about the cost over there. Okay, so uh, for people who went to, the, to law school here in the United States or know about law school in the United States, they darn near have a heart attack when they see the prices. Um, <laughs> When I was there in, in 2011, meeting in France, um, I was going to the University of Miami, and I believe that year I paid in tuition $39,000 uh, for the year in 2011. Um, yeah. So my first question is, how much were you paying for your master two at University of Versailles Saint Quentin? It was less than 800 euros. Okay, for the whole year? Yeah. Okay, all right. Making me feel bad there, all right. Um, how about your licence, your undergraduate degree? Do you remember how much you paid? It was even less. I won't remember exactly, but it was under 500. Per year? Per year. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Very nice. So the fees for the IEJ were uh, under 800 as well. Okay. For the EIJ. Um, yeah. How about bar school? The bar school was more expensive. It was 100 and 1,600 euros. I ask now, it's 1,800, so it's even more expensive than it was. 
Okay. How about the uh, the last step, the actual licensing and swearing in ceremony? Yes, because right after the CAPA, the CAPA exam, you are not done yet. You're not an attorney yet. Uh, you have to, from the exam, you have to go to the uh, l'ordre des avocats, we say in French. So it's the 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 order of for for the attorneys. It's uh, our um, administrative authority. From there, you have to ask for a swearing in ceremony day, and you have to pay 800 euros of fees. Okay, got it. And I have a very, very important uh, substantive question about the swearing in ceremony. And that is, do you guys wear your robes at the swearing in ceremony? Actually, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know that you like the robe. I, you know I love the robe. So let's talk about that for a second. Uh, for those yeah. who don't know, you guys, in the United States, we're used to just judges wearing robes. Lawyers don't wear robes. But you guys, meaning French lawyers, when you're in court, you wear a robe, a long robe, correct? Correct. Yeah, we have to wear the robe when we stand before a judge, when we, stand, when we are defending our client interest before a judicial authority. Okay. Do you know about the history of the robe or why you guys wear it in court there? Yeah, actually, we learned the origin of the robe during the bar school, and it comes from the history, because the first attorneys were used to be uh, men of church. So that's why... Oh. Yeah, that's why priests, priests and attorneys have similar robes. Okay. Okay, very interesting. Do you have your robe on you right now, by any chance? I have it, but I will wear it only if the viewers will like the video and subscribe to your channel. Okay, so okay. maybe we'll post the video. During this time, they will like, like the video, subscribe, and then we'll get back with the robe on. Okay, Let's, sounds good. Let's do that. Okay, so Michelle, you have the robe on right now. It looks very nice. looks very formal. Um, you know, I can see you're ready to go to war in court right now. Um, <laughs> what's the robe called in French? It's actually robe. So it's robe as well. Robe d'avocat. Okay. Before we move on, I'm just curious. Uh, you know I like the robe, um, but you kind of have mixed feelings about it, huh? I have. I'm not sure it has an added value. So... Okay, moving on. Uh, we're pretty much, we're almost done, Michelle. I just want to ask you uh, one more question about starting your practice in uh, after you're sworn in. Um, so, you know, nowadays in 2019, young professionals the world over are getting used to the idea of working remotely, where basically people are working from their homes or coffee shops or, you know, office or whatever. In France, is it the case that a lot of young lawyers starting off work remotely or do you guys all have an office? You have to have an office, but it hasn't have to be a full-time office, dedicated office. So you have to have one, you have to have access to an office, but if you work most of the time as a counsel, let's say, uh, you, and, you can, and you're fine working from home, on the phone, on Skype, on, by email, it's fine as well, but you, you just have to have an office. So. Okay, so now, Michelle, are you ready for the lightning round of questions? I am. Okay. First question, coffee or tea? Coffee. Okay. Definitely. We need yep. a, lot of, a lot of coffee, as you know. Okay. Cats or dogs? Cats. Okay. What's your favorite place in the world? I'd say my parents' hometown village in Lebanon. Okay. If you weren't a lawyer, what would you be doing? Well, I think I'd open a restaurant. I like to cook. What type of restaurant? I don't know yet. So maybe that's why I didn't switch yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And my last question, what's one piece of advice that you would give an 18-year-old Michel Massard? I'd say to him, just do it. Nice. All right. Very good advice. Um, okay, that does it for the interview. Michelle, I really want to thank you for coming on. I think it was a very productive interview, and I hope that we added some value for people looking uh, to find out about how you become a lawyer in France. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. My pleasure. Thanks.